psychedelic sound civilization. I, uh, I am of the view that, that psychedelics are an extremely serious matter, and uh, I don't believe that for children. I think psychedelics should be one of those things, and there are others, that are rightly reserved for adults in our society. But I do believe that the right to choose to take the psychedelics is a fundamental human right of adults, from which we should not be alienated. The question is to take them with the right spirit, with the right intent, in the right setting. However, I'm going to go through um, some historical cultures and their connections to psychedelics and indeed other substances. Um, and this, this, of course, you know, clearly indicates the, the view in our society today. And I, I don't disagree with it. I think, I think schools should be drug free. And I think actually if all drugs were illegal uh, and accompanied by wise advice, we would have much less of a problem, much less of a drug problem, much less likelihood of children getting access to drugs from some scum drug dealer on the phone. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. We can take control of this issue and uh, accompany these substances with, uh, with wise advice. It wasn't that way in uh, this school in ancient Egypt either. Um, this is a 1,700-year-old schoolroom in the Dakla oasis in Lower Egypt, and uh, Greek writings on its uh, walls uh, include positive references to drugs in context of a story from the Odyssey about the Trojan War. So Helen of Troy gives her guests a drug. It's most likely opium, opium, and uh, it takes away grief and anger and forgetfulness of every ill. Who should drink down, uh, drink this down when it is in a bowl would not let fall a tear down his cheek in the course of that day at least. I mean, we can't imagine that being written on a modern schoolroom wall. And uh, it hints to us that there is something different in the past about the way that people of the past looked at, uh, let us say, uh, mind-altering uh, uh, substances. Um, here we're looking at the uh, opium poppy. Uh, interestingly, in uh, Knossos, uh, they had an opium poppy goddess. And you can see the cuts down the side of the opium poppy where the sap comes, caps on the sap comes out. I, I wonder why the screen is um, cutting me off left and right. And I wonder if something could be done about that. Um, it's. Uh, Just bear with us a moment. I can't get into anything other than presenting. familiar with the majestic poem Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Um, if I can remember, I'll quote a few lines from it. Uh, in, in Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure drum decree, where off the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. Samuel Taylor Coleridge was uh, under the influence in a sort of reverie brought on by two grains of opium when he wrote this poem. Uh, there came a knock at the door. Uh, it was the postman with a package. By the time Coleridge had taken deliver, delivery of the package, he'd forgotten the rest of the poem. And so Zanadu is an incomplete poem. But it tells us that some majestic works of poetry can be uh, connected to substances that we fear and hate in our society. I don't like the title of William Emberden's book, but otherwise it's an excellent book. It isn't only about narcotics, it's about uh, all kinds of substances in the, in, in the past. 
hallucinogens, stimulants, inebriates, hypnotics, their origins and uses. Uh, and some points are made in there. For example, here we see Nefertiti presenting <coughs> opium poppy heads to her husband, Akhenaten. Uh, I certainly can't imagine Queen Elizabeth giving to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here, into the third eye of the initiate, we see rays which are composed of datura plasmas. Datura is a powerful visionary uh, aid. And the, the, blue, the blue water lily is all over that uh, ancient Egyptian art. Uh, and uh, believe me, it wasn't just about the aroma of the blue water. The blue water lily uh, is a, a, a mild hallucinogen, and the way to potentiate it is to uh, dissolve it in uh, something like, like wine. Uh, so we know that the ancient Egyptians were using it for its mind-affecting properties. Um, because uh, traces of a liquid extract from the blue water that he were discovered in alabaster jars, stored in the annex of Tutankhamun's tomb, 14th century BC in Upper Egypt. <coughs> this is the ancient Egyptian tree of light. And uh, what we see here, you can see this relief at the Temple of Karnak in Upper Egypt. And what we see here is the god Thoth, the god of wisdom, the inventor of writing. Um, and he is writing the name of Pharaoh Seti I on the Tree of Life. Effectively, he's bestowing upon Seti I, or rather Seti I, through his activities in this life, has earned the life of millions of years. Uh, my friend Dennis McKenna, who is the brother of the late, great uh, Terence McKenna, Dennis is an ethnopharmacologist, and he's identified this tree. And this tree is acacia nilotica. And it is a tree that is rich in DMT, the most powerful hallucinogen known to man. Now, there's a bit of a chemical project involved in getting the DMT out of the bar <coughs> and into a human being. Um, and uh, the view of academics generally, the this, is that the ancient Egyptians couldn't possibly have had the necessary chemical knowledge to extract the DMT from the bark of the fish uh, But then we have to ask ourselves, where does the word chemistry actually come from? It comes from the ancient name for Egypt, Kemet. The word alchemy is alchemy, that's what the Arabs refer to. And we get our word chemistry, its root is in the ancient Egyptian, the name of ancient Egypt itself. So I, I think there's probably very little doubt that the ancient Egyptians did know how to extract DMT from the tree of life. And it's not an accident that they chose this tree uh, to uh, speak of immortal life. So I think we can say that we know what the ancient Egyptians were smoking. <laughs> Second shrine of Tutankhamun's tomb. Star in the sky, rays descending into the third eye of the initiate. It's a transcendent scene, amazing. An amazing scene of initiation. Um, interestingly enough, the, the uh, third eye, uh, in the, the, the pineal gland, as we call it today, does closely resemble the ancient Egyptian eye of Horus. Uh, and we see much pineal symbolism uh, in ancient Egyptian armor. Back to Tiwanaku, and uh, as I mentioned today, these aren't ray guns, uh, these are snuff trays for the consumption of Anadonathra polybrina, uh, snuffs which contain dimethyltryptin. Um, this uh, tells us that whoever was involved in the construction and creation of Tiwanaku, they were not fighting the war on drugs. They were definitely interested in the properties and effects of these substances, so much so that they uh, used them in their economy. About 60 miles north of Lima is a place called Supe, and near Supe have been discovered and excavated in the last 10 15 years. Just a massive, extraordinary series of pyramids. Um, this site is called Karal. And it's given the lie to the, the... It used to be said by academics that there could be no connection between pyramids of the old world and pyramids of the new world because new world pyramids were much younger. Well, that's no longer the case because the orthodox dating for the Giza pyramids is 2,500 or so BC, and uh, that is the dating of uh, Karal as well. It dates back about four and a half, five thousand years. Um, when this place was found, it was realized that it was part of a huge urban complex, and the initial prejudice of archaeologists was that uh, it must have been built up around warfare. 
so often when we look at the past, we aren't looking um, through a window, we're looking at a mirror. We project our own culture onto the past, because our culture is built around warfare. There was a feeling that this must be so at Corral. Turned out not to be the case. There's no evidence of any warfare, any hostility, any fighting at all at ancient Corral. Uh, extensive trade networks, cooperation with their neighbors, and amongst their imports, hallucinogenic snuffs from the Amazon. Ah, Francisco de Oriana, a conquistador. In the 1540s, he takes 20 men in a longboat on a one-day fishing expedition uh, on the Amazon. The Amazon disagrees, and 4,000 miles later, they turn up in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> they've had an extraordinary journey, and along the way, they've witnessed great cities alongside the Amazon, uh, with evidence of a high culture and great intelligence and, and skill. Um, he thought Oriana is full of praise for these cities, and he was never believed. Afterwards, for centuries, everybody says, Oriana made it all up. Of course there were no cities in the Amazon. The Amazon was a pristine jungle, because of the hunter gatherers. How could there be any cities in the jungle? Well, the tragic clearances of the Amazon rainforest are revealing that Francisco de Oriana told the truth, and that actually the Amazon is not a pristine rainforest. It's a managed environment, and it's very old, and it's been created and developed skillfully and scientifically by human beings, and it did support very large urban populations. And that's what Oriana witnessed. Unfortunately, it was the arrival of the Spanish in South America that brought smallpox to South America. And it was smallpox that devastated and utterly destroyed the populations of all those cities, which then fell into ruin, uh, and are only being seen again uh, today. Um, Rainforest soils aren't great for agriculture generally. That's why it's such a stupid idea to cut down all the old rainforest and turn it into soybean farms, amongst other reasons why it's an incredibly stupid idea. But uh, there are areas of the Amazon where there is an, an incredibly rich and fertile soil, which is called terra preta, the black area. This soil, it turns out, is a man-made soil. It has got bacteria within it which regenerate it. Uh, it's it, it's uh, self-replicating. It continues to its fertility to this day, and the indications are that its origins are more than 11,000 years in the past. And it's still sought out to this day, and it's still used for, for planting in the, in the heart of the Amazon. It's very ancient. So this tells us that some people who really understood some stuff that we might call scientific were, were in the Amazon long, long ago. Um, and this is the kind of things that are emerging from the Amazon rainforest, these huge geoglyphs, uh, even um, stone circles and megaliths are appearing in the areas of the Amazon that are, that are cleared. So we have to accept that the Amazon is another place where the hidden history of humanity remains to be uncovered. It's uh, home to more than 150,000 different species of plants and trees, incredible resource of biodiversity. Um, and I'm with a, a shaman here called Francisco Montes um in uh, the jungle. And uh, what we're doing is we're picking the leaves off a plant called Cicotria deridis. Um, the, the, um, it's known in the Amazon as Shakuna. And Cicotria deridis, uh, the leaves contain dimethyltryptamine, DMT. Um, I know I'm talking to a very well-informed audience, so you're all, you're all well aware, I think, that DMT is not normally orally active. Um, if we access DMT today, we tend to either smoke it. The most efficient way is, is to deliver it as an intravenous uh, infusion, which is what, what Rick Strassman did with his volunteers at the University of New Mexico, which I'll come on to. Um, it's not normally orally active because of an enzyme in the gut called monoamine oxidase. So monoamine oxidase switches off DMT contact. So if you want to um, make a tea of hundreds of these leaves and drink it, you're welcome to do so. They won't have any effect on you whatsoever, apart from giving you a belly ache. Um, what you need is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And that is what is contained in the ayahuasca vine. The ayahuasca vine contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which switches off that enzyme in the gut uh, and allows the DMT in the leaves to become orally active when the two are cooked together. The leaves and the vines cook together, break up lengths of the vines, stick them in a cooking pot, put 300 of the leaves on top, 
more lakes of the vine on top of that, and then cook and cook and cook and boil down with water from the creek until you know uh, you end up with a sort of sticky residue at the bottom, then add more water, boil again, and eventually they often de 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 decanted into plastic bottles these days. Uh, you'll get this uh, dark, sometimes black, sometimes red uh, brew filled with vegetable matter. Um, the most ghastly taste on the planet. Uh, when I drink ayahuasca, I hold my nose. Actually, even talking about it makes me feel slightly good. Uh, um, and uh, so, essence of old socks, um, <laughs> some battery acid, uh, a bit of sulfur, some raw sewage, and uh, just a hint of chocolate. That's roughly the, that's roughly the uh, ayahuasca uh, taste. Believe me, this is not stuff that you do for recreation. Uh, it's called the purge in the Amazon. It's going to make you vomit, it's going to give you diarrhea, uh, all of which, of course, can be experienced as deeply unpleasant, particularly by us in the West. Uh, when I had my first sessions in the Amazon jungle, I mean, I'm British, you know, we're incredible. <laughs> and the, the, the prospect of, as uh, my stomach is rumbling, the prospect of having to run behind a tree and drop my pants and everybody listening to me was <laughs> almost more than I could bear. Um, however, nature called and I had to go, and, and uh, that's when I, I got the first lesson from my Oscar, which is actually we are not our body, we are our consciousness. That's what we are. Uh, the body is just a vehicle for our consciousness. And the cleansing that goes on, the vomiting and the diarrhea, are part of a, it's understood in the Amazon, they're part of a necessary cleansing process for the medicine to do its work. You have to get this stuff out of you. Physical toxins and also psychic toxins. Amazing number of people who vomit into the bucket see the demons coming out with vomit. Uh, and I wouldn't discount that. Um, we go here uh, up into the high Andes, about 200 miles north of Peru. Uh, let's turn right and go to Chavin de Guantan. And uh, there's Chavin, and uh, near this town of Chavin, this is an inscription that was originally written in 1616, lies a great edifice made of well carved stones of notable grandeur. It was a huaca, and the shrine of the most famous of the pagans, as Rome or Jerusalem is, to make their offerings and sacrifices because the devil in this place gave them many oracles, and thus they came from all over the kingdom. Beneath the ground are great halls and rooms so great that there are certain stories that they extend beneath the river and past near the Huaca or ancient shrine. A couple of points here. First off, it was the friars uh, and with their, with their missionary zeal uh, who attempted to stamp out the use of these traditional plant medicines uh, in the in the Andes and indeed uh, all over the world. And secondly, these great halls that are referred to in this, um, in this inscription do exist and they are part of the setting for extraordinary psychedelic rituals. Uh, these are the hallways underneath Chavin de Guantan. You can wander through them for ages. Uh, sometimes you'll encounter an entity like this carved in stone. This is part human and part serpent uh, in form. It's called the Lazon. It's pretty scary to come up against it. Um, and another view of the galleries. All of this was a setting for the consumption of um, a visionary plant that uh, we call San Pedro. It's called Guachuma uh, in the Andes today. And that is the San Pedro cactus. The active ingredient is mescaline, the same ingredient that we find in the peyote cactus. Uh, and we're left in no doubt that it was central to the rituals at Chavin de Pantan. So the great culture of Chavin uh, somehow managed to build itself up while using powerful hallucinogens, which is contrary to the argument made by our society today. Um, ancient cultures um, universally revered the substances that we demonize today. Uh, the, here we see a deer with a peyote button from Monte Alban in Oaxaca, a peyote bowl from Western Mexico, and the peyote cactus, again, the active ingredient is uh, mescaline. I like the pyramid of the inscriptions that the, the Maya were using peyote and also using psilocybin uh, does not appear to have stopped them from creating a majestic culture in the Central American uh, country with uh, beautiful, beautiful architecture uh, and with a calendar that is an incredible work of technology whereby you can predict eclipses 
to the minute, 200,000 years into the future, 200,000 years into the past, which has a better estimate of the length of the solar year than we use today. All of this in a culture that venerated and made wide use of hallucinogens, which are illegal and demonized in our society today. Uh, I showed this picture earlier, the earliest image of Quetzalcoatl, um, and it was found in a lair that's associated with a predecessor culture to the Maya called the Olmecs. They're typical um, large stone heads look like, look like this, found in the same archaeological site. But the Olmecs also used hallucinogens. Uh, here we see uh, an Olmec baby weir jaguar wearing an Amanita muscaria fly agaric mushroom cap. And we see the Amanita muscaria mushroom transforming into the jaguar dog uh, here. So, so clearly, Amanita muscaria was, uh, was important to the ancient Um And I don't have time to go into all the supporting evidence, but there's a very powerful case that the mysterious substance referred to as Soma in the Vedas, the most ancient texts of India, uh, was actually Amanita muscaria. Now, I need to tell you something a little bit disgusting about Amanita muscaria. Um, and that's this, that uh, it's much more effective uh, if you pass it through a human body first. In other words, and that's what they do in Siberia with, um, with Amanita muscaria. The shaman will take it upon himself to eat a bunch of the mushrooms. And then he'll pee in a bowl, and then members of the community will drink his urine. Um, and they will have an incredible journey. <laughs> the reason is that the human body, and in fact, reindeer do the same thing, they eat Amanita muscaria, and their urine is highly prized. Filters out some of the toxins in Amanita muscaria, which otherwise interfere with the journey. Uh, it's much more effective in the form of urine. Uh, and actually, tests have indicated that you could pass Amanita muscaria through seven human bodies before it loses its potency. Uh, that's why a verse in the Vedas that speaks of priests drinking. Soma and then pissing Soma uh, is quite indicative that they are using Amanita muscaria. There's much more evidence for that. Eleusis was the beating heart of ancient Greece. It's a, it's a ruin today, about 30 miles outside of Athens. Um, but uh, for 2,000 years, until Christian fanatics closed it down in the 4th century AD, the Eleusinian mysteries were central to the high culture of ancient Greece, and each year pilgrims used to go there, and they were given a brew called the kaikion, the ingredients of which we know. Um, and uh, they then went into underground halls and galleries, rather like those at Shabin, it's called the Telestrion at Eleusis, and they had life-changing experiences. What uh, this is a terrific book, The Road, the Road to the Eusis, uh, tells us uh, and, and documents in the greatest detail uh, is that that brew, the Kaikion, which included barley, also included Kranichef Aspari, which is a non poisonous form of ergot containing LSD like visionary alkaloids. They were, in other words, having a life changing experience at a Eusis, basically on LSD. And uh, here's uh, Pindar. Happy is he who, having seen these rites, goes below the hollow earth. For he knows the end of life, and he knows its God-sent beginning. There's no terror of death after you've had these experiences, because you know that you're not just your body. Uh, other initiates included Plato, Aristotle, and Sophocles. Sophocles wrote, thrice happy are those mortals who, having seen these rites, depart for Hades. And by the way, the Greek concept of Hades was not the same as ours today. Uh, for them alone is granted to have a true life there. Uh, in other words, there's something to learn from this experience that helps us to deal with the mystery of death and to understand that we are, that we are not limited only to, to this life. So Cicero wrote, Athens has given nothing to the world more excellent or divine than the Eleusinian mystery. Uh, really, we shouldn't be surprised to find the use of psychedelics at the heart of just so many ancient civilizations because psychedelics actually appear to have played a key role in the evolution of the emergence of modern human behavior. Um, this is what I call uh, six million years of boredom. 
<laughs> this is the chart that traces the descent or the ascent of humanity from the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee about six million years ago through into until anatomically modern humans who, you know, is surviving anatomically modern human skeletons about 195,000 years old, and it's from uh, the field. Um, for the first several million years, we did nothing as far as leaving any trace in the record is concerned. There's a few footprints here and there. Two and a half million years ago, we invent the first uh, stone tools. Um, this is called the uh, older one tradition, the great technological breakthrough. Um, and uh, once we've invented them, two things become apparent. Cultural traditions are being passed on, and our ancestors are incredibly rigid and narrow-minded and, uh, and unable to innovate, because once they've got those tools, they stick with them without any change for more than a million years. Uh, and then when they introduce a change, why that sticks for more than a million years as well. These would have been very boring people to have been. <laughs> they were not lateral thinkers. They were not creative. They were not really identifiable as human in any way. And then suddenly this happens. After 100,000 years ago, you get this incredible breakthrough. Amazing symbolic art starts to appear. And it reaches its apogee with the, the painted caves of, of uh, Southern Europe. And also, now cave paintings equally are old found in uh, Indonesia. This is Lasco uh, in southern France. Uh, when Picasso visited Lasco in 1947, he came out stunned. He was interviewed as he left the cave by reporters, and as an artist, what did he think of the art of the Stone Age predecessors? And he said, we today have invented nothing. They had all the skill that we have. So this is, this is modern symbolic human behavior that's manifested. Now, there are certain distinctive characteristics about this art, and actually, these characteristics are found all around the world, uh, wherever rock and cave art is found. And one of those characteristics is the frequent depiction of entities that are called therianthropes. That's from the Greek therion, which means wild beast, and anthropos, which means man. They're part animal, part human in form. And here, from Fumani Cave in Italy, we have a classic therianthrope who's got the body and arms of human being, but the head and horns of an orocca, an extinct species of cattle. And from Hollenstein Stadel Cave in Germany, this uh, piece of mammoth ivory, which is about knee high, and which is carved into the shape of a, of a lion man. Uh, head of a lion, but the, the head of a, a lion, but the human legs and arms. So what's going on with all of this? If we go to um, the Cedarberg in South Africa, we can see perched on a zigzag entities that are human, but they're, they're transforming into antelopes. And down here in the Drakensberg in South Africa, difficult to see because I'm afraid the, the, the projector is a bit fuzzy, but these are two human bodies and sets of human legs. They've got the heads of antelopes. This one's got two feathers growing out of its back. This one's got two serpents wrapped around its body, and those serpents are also antelope-headed. I think we can safely say that when you're out hunting on the plains of southern Africa, you do not see an antelope-headed serpent uh, or an antelope-headed human being, let alone one growing feathers out of its back. Uh, so what is, what is going on? What inspired this art? This is Chauvet Cave, 32, 33,000 years old in France. Notice the lions down here. Cave lions. And then what do we have up here? We have bison man. The head and horns of a bison, the hump of a bison, but then a human body, human butt, and the human legs. Uh, and bison man is straddling a large female figure from the triangle, leaving us in that doubt, a large female figure, but weirdly she is headless, except, look at her right arm. Her right arm is transforming into the head of a lion. So this is bison man, lion woman, and this is definitely not something that you see every day. Where did the inspiration come from? This is a moment of transformation, this is a moment of shape-shifting that is being depicted in this 33,000 year old arm. What inspired them? What inspired all of this weirdness? Why is there a grid between these two ibexes from Lasco Cave? Why do we have these flows of dots and more grid-like patterns on the wall of El Castillo Cave? 
in Spain. What does it all come to? How are we to explain this? Well, the explanation has come from work with human volunteers in the modern era using harmful visionary substances like LSD, DMT, mescaline, psilocybin, and so on and so forth. Um, it's very important now that I pay tribute to the late, great Terence McKenna. Uh, Insight of his wonderful, wonderful book, Food of the Dog, uh, which indeed identifies psychedelics as key to the great food of modern human behavior. Uh, the parents just seem to have been unaware of parallel work that was going on since the 1970s in South Africa uh, by an archaeologist called David Lewis Williams. And um, it's in, it, it, I want to tell you a bit about David Lewis Williams' work. He came to his theory from uh, evidence with human volunteers and uh, powerful psychedelics. And what that evidence showed is that certain imagery is um, very commonly experienced. Initially, these sort of scintillating patterns, zigzag lines, internested curves, ridge rectangle starbursts. Uh, and then you, then you may get the sense of passing through a vortex uh, into a seamlessly convincing parallel universe, where you may be spoken to telepathically by entities. Uh, and this volunteer, I believe, was on uh, mescaline, and this volunteer depicted a man in a modern business suit, but with the head of a fox. That was one of the entries that spoke to him. And that's just so obviously the same thing as the bison man and the lion man from the painted cave, that we have to consider that those in the painted caves were getting their inspiration the same way, that they were using psychedelics. And indeed, that is the theory of Professor David Lewis theory that was developed since the early 1970s, and which is now the ruling model. Uh, it's one of the very few areas where I find myself in agreement with uh, He's fought through a lot of opposition, and it's now accepted that the, the presence of the theory of certain distinctive patterns suggest that this was an art of visions. And David argues that it was the work of prehistoric shamans who'd experienced altered states of consciousness, trance states, and afterwards set out to document their visions, including with encounter, encounters with spirits, etc., by painting and engraving them uh, on the cave walls. In other words, the evidence for the use of psychedelics is present in the character of the art itself. And, and if you want to go further into David Lewis Williams' work, I highly recommend The Mind in the Cave, Consciousness and the Origin of Art. It's a superb book and really, really worth uh, reading. And it's called the Neuropsychological Theory of Cave Art, and it's now the ruling paradigm. Now, David, unfortunately, well, it's up to him, I mean, everybody has their own job choice. So he belongs to that branch of science that is called materialist deduction. Uh, he doesn't believe that there's any meaning to these visions. Uh, he thinks that it's simply our brain on drugs. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I had a long conversation with David about this. He's never taken any psychedelics. Um, he says he doesn't want to fry his brain, but he's done the research, and the research indicates that uh, this, was the, this was the case. Actually, his main critic has never been any psychedelic either, uh, so when the two of them argue, it's a bit like a couple of monks uh, arguing about the best positions for sex. Um, <laughs> latterly, uh, this cave was found, it actually contains imagery of psilocyte Hispanica, uh, and uh, it's being trumpeted as the earliest evidence for magic mushroom use in Europe, but of course that evidence was there all along in the character of the art itself. So, when this art is introduced, that's when we have the most significant leap forward in the entire story of the evolution of human behavior, and it's long after we've become anatomically modern. It's as though the hardware was in place, but we didn't have the software and the psychedelics seem to have provided the software. So stone tools, hunting tactics, spiritual ideas, they all take a huge leap forward at the time that our ancestors begin to manifest evidence that they've experienced altered states of uh, consciousness. Um, and uh, linguistic evidence suggests this was the time when spoken languages first appeared. It's really, as I repeat myself, the most significant change in the whole story of the evolution of human behavior. We cannot prove that it was caused by psychedelics. We can say that there is a powerful correlation with evidence for the use of psychedelics and with this radical change in human behavior. Personally, I think it was a cause, a causative relationship, but I can't prove that. Um, in the light of the evidence of the caves, I think we need to take a fresh look at ancient art all around the world. Maybe psychedelics have played a much greater role in the story of civilization than has hitherto been admitted. So this Toltita ceramic from Ecuador, we see the arm of this figure transforming into a serpent. 
Well, that's exactly what's going on in this image from Shelley Cave, where this woman's arm is transforming into the head of a lion. Um, all make stone figure I'm with a feline featured, bird headed figure seated on a throne from the Maya. We begin to understand that all of this is inspired by visionary experiences, and perhaps the most efficient method of getting into the visionary trance state is the psychedelic. Um, so, the famous story of the Minotaur. The Minotaur is a classic creature of vision. Uh, uh, in a card, a bull man wrestling with a lion. Again, that's a visionary scene. That's not something you see in everyday life. These creatures from Mesopotamia. And of course, all of the Egyptian gods are very anthropic uh, in form, uh, indicating again that ancient Egypt was a culture that embraced and explored and found value in visionary experiences. So it's reasonable to wonder why is it that our society is so rabid about consciousness altering drugs and art? And particularly where the psychedelics are concerned. What is it that those in power are really afraid of? Because it's a serious criminal offense to possess DMT. And as I'll be explaining, DMT is a natural brain hack. We are all illegal in this room. We all have the appear in our body. Yet to possess it, whether in smokable form or as part of the ayahuasca group, is a serious criminal offense. Uh, you can have your door broken down, you can have your reputation ruined, you can be placed in jail, uh, put under the power of others simply because you wish to explore your own consciousness with something that is actually natural to the human body, just adding the amount of, of it in, in the human body. Um, and certainly our culture is not against drugs that alter consciousness as such. Uh, on the contrary, um, Big Pharma is licensed to make billions of dollars every year with drugs that alter consciousness. Um, the antidepressants. I had an encounter with antidepressants in the 90s. Uh, I used Siroxat uh, and Prozac through an episode of depression. I hated those drugs. They made me numb. They were, they, they were, they were horrible. When I decided to get off Siroxat, I decided one day I was not going to take this shit anymore. I stopped. And the very next day I started having suicidal thoughts. Really quite rational ones. It's very, the best thing to do is just kill yourself, right? You know, get on with it. Um, cold and rational. And then I, I obviously realized that something was seriously wrong. Uh, so I went back to the Siroxab and I began to cut it down just a tiny slice every day. And I took six months and I weaned myself off it. And finally I was clear of that horrible, horrible drug. Um, just as well, because six months later, ayahuasca came into my life. And one thing you don't want to do is to drink ayahuasca while taking an SSRI uh, as a because there is a very severe drug interaction called serotonin syndrome. Um, and Ritalin for hyperactive children, you know. I mean, there's an unholy alliance between big pharma and medical doctors uh, to invent, and, and psychiatrists to invent ever more uh, imaginary mental illnesses for which ever more horrible pills are prescribed. Um, and and uh, this is okay in our society. Nobody questions it. It's considered to be a good thing. Uh, even though the number of suicides connected to the SSRIs climbs every year, it is really a very serious matter. And of course, we embrace this drug, the most boring drug known to man, the drug called alcohol, which is glamorized in our society. Many people who declare themselves to be strongly against drugs and who proudly announce that they've never taken a drug in their life. Forget that glass of wine every night. Or the beer. Or the several glasses of wine. And let's be honest, I mean, when we have that glass of wine at five or six o'clock in the evening, it may taste nice, but we're not primarily drinking it for the taste, are we? We're drinking it for the buzz. A little bit of, takes the edge off. You know, takes the edge off our day. And therefore, it's the effects of alcohol and consciousness that primarily account for its success. And this is a glamorized drug, even though it's an incredibly dangerous drug, a drug that is responsible for tens of thousands of deaths every year, a drug that leads people to fight one another, that promotes aggression and anger, um, that, that leads people to have horrible traffic accidents, um, that, that causes cirrhosis of the liver. There's an epidemic of cirrhosis, particularly among young women in our society today. Uh, and, and all of this is a drug that's totally legal in, in our society. Uh, so clearly, our society isn't against uh, 
uh, consciousness altering drugs as such. It's again a particular kind of consciousness altering drug. Many different states of consciousness are available to us. And the one that our society really values is what I call the alert problem solving state of consciousness. That is the dominant state of consciousness that's valued and glorified in our society. And it has its place. Don't get me wrong, I am not against the alert problem solving state of consciousness. Uh, as I often point out, if I get on an airplane, I want, I require the pilot to be in an alert problem solving state of consciousness. <laughs> and I would like him to stay in that state of consciousness all the way through the flight. After he lands, I don't care what he does with his head. But while he's flying me, he better be alert and problem solving. So it has its place. Um, I would say that uh, alcohol and the antidepressants are tolerated because they actually don't challenge that state of mind. Alcohol is your little holiday from being alert and problem solving. It makes you perhaps feel you'll be more efficient the next day. The antidepressants uh, keep you going to work and being a, a productive uh, producer and consumer. Psychedelics, on the other hand, tend to lead to questioning of the established control system of our society and the states of consciousness that uh, serve it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Gnostics. Christianity is a complicated religion. It isn't, it's an edited artifact in the form that we find it today. There was an early form of Christianity. Uh, the Christians saw themselves as Gnostics, uh, for whom revealed knowledge was the, was the crucial thing. Uh, and these, uh, these Gnostics were one of the factions of Christianity in the early years of Rome. Uh, but uh, around about the 350s AD, the Emperor Constantine was converted to Christianity by another of the Christian faction, the very literalist Christian faction that became the Roman Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, the story goes that Constantine, who had boiled his wife alive in a bath, uh, was um, going around the different religions in Rome. He was getting old and he was worried about his soul. And he was going to all these, he was an incredibly cruel man. He was going to all these religions and he was saying, can you save my soul? And they said, sorry mate, we can't do anything for you at all, you're too far gone. Uh, but the Christians who became the Roman Catholics, they said, we can sort it out for you. And uh, he converted to Christianity. Other factions of Christianity immediately began to be suppressed. And they included the Gnostics. Amongst the first people to be burned at the stake were the Gnostics, burned at the stake by the Roman Catholics. For a long time, centuries and centuries, we only knew about Gnostic spiritual ideas through the words of their persecutors, because a determined effort was made to get rid of every Gnostic text, every Gnostic document, to erase Gnosticism from history. Um, but it didn't quite work, because near this temple, the Temple of Hathor at Dendera in Upper Egypt, um, at a place called Mac Hamadi, a group of Gnostics buried a library of their texts. That's called the Magna Library today. It was founded in 1945. Went through a long story, but eventually all the texts were translated. And uh, this is the book, the Magna Library. It's the definitive translation of the Gnostic scriptures in one volume. James Robinson is the editor. Uh, I highly urge anybody who's interested in Gnosticism to, to get that very large book and make the effort to read the Gnostic scriptures because they are profoundly subversive of the existing order of things. And if we're concerned about the existing order of things, then we should look at what the Gnostics have to say. Um, it was long held that uh, ideas, that Gnosticism was ideas or coherent systems that are characterized by an absolutely negative view of the visible world and its creator, and the assumption of a divine spark in man, his inner self, which had become enclosed within the material body as a result of a tragic event in the pre-cosmic world, from which it can only escape to its divine origins by means of the saving gnosis. There's some truth in that, but also some falsehood. Um, the Gnostics did not hate matter, and they did not hate the world. How could they? When they saw our Earth as the manifestation of a Gnostic aeon, or goddess, called Sophia. Uh, it is the fall. Gnostic cosmology is very difficult, and I just can't give it all to you here. Uh, but but uh, the Gnostics saw the realm of the aeons the realm of true divinity as being totally spirit and very, very far from the, from the material realm. And, and Sophia is, a, is one of those aeons. 
But she starts to dream. She starts to envisage the anthropos. She is envisaging humanity. And in that dream, she falls from the theremin. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, she manifests as planet Earth. Uh, in that fall, uh, a rupture is created in the cosmos. And out of that rupture is uh, created the demiurge and the archons. Now, the archons are evil angels who work for the demiurge. Sophia has planted the divine spark within humanity that the purpose of the demiurge of the archons is to suppress and snuff out that divine spark and never to allow us to realize our true spiritual destiny. And now this is where, um, for those who adhere to the mainstream monotheistic faiths, Gnosticism can be a bit shocking. Because Gnosticism says, essentially, that the entity we have been taught to worship as God, whether we call him Jehovah, or Yahweh, or just God, or Allah, they say he's not God at all. That entity is the Demiurge. You know the line from The Usual Suspects, the greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world he did not exist. The Gnostics take it a step further. The greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world that he is God. They are saying that the entity that we've been worshipping for 2,000 years as God is in fact a kind of demon, a puffed up, minor, supernatural, the chief of the archons, he's malicious, he's jealous, he's egotistical, uh, and he's deluded many into believing that he is God, our creator and the creator of the world. Envying the divine spark within us, this demiurge and his archons seek to mislead and enslave mankind and work to prevent us from ever awakening to our true potential. Thus they spread fear, hatred and suspicion amongst us and drive us into all manner of reckless crime, into wars and frauds and all things hostile to the nature of the soul. The archons are particularly sinister. They disguise themselves as human beings. They move amongst us. And their project is to deceive and mislead us and to snuff out the divine spark within us. So it's interesting to see how the Gnostics turn everything upside down. We've all been taught that the serpent is the bad guy in the Garden of Eden telling Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. From the Gnostic point of view, the serpent is the good guy. Because we are not just meat robots who are meant to just go on without change, without thinking, without challenge to our lives. From the Gnostic point of view, it's essential to have knowledge of good and evil. If you don't have knowledge of good and evil, you can't make choices. And the choices are what define us and how we grow ourselves as spirit. So from the Gnostic point of view, when the serpent encourages Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge of good people, uh, the serpent is offering a liberation. This is the first step to liberation, is to eat of the tree of knowledge of good people and become responsible for ourselves and to realize that we make choices every day, every minute between good and evil. Sometimes big choices, sometimes small choices, but the choices are always there. And the demiurge sought to deprive us of all of that. So it's interesting that the tree of life in the Gnostic, sorry, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Gnostic scheme of things is the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Uh, and sometimes a psilocybin mushroom. And uh, interestingly also, the serpent is almost always shown in art as a therianthrope, with the head of a human being and the, and the body of a serpent. Uh, so we know what happened to Adam and Eve. They naughtily ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Demiurge gets furious about this, and drives them out of the garden, humiliatingly beating them about the bottom with swords and so on and so forth, and closing off the garden that they may never come back into it. I'll come to that at the end of the talk. Um, another thing they turn upside down is the flood. According to the Gnostics, the flood wasn't inflicted to punish evil. That's what the Old Testament informs us, but to punish humanity for having risen so high and to take the light, the gnosis, that was growing amongst men. And the survivors were thrown into great distraction and into a life of toil, so that mankind might be occupied with worldly affairs and might not have the opportunity of being devoted to the Holy Spirit. And actually, throughout history, those who have sought the liberating gnosis, the light, knowledge of the true nature of things, have been present. Uh, let me give you the example of the Cathars. The Cathars were a late Gnostic sect. Gnosticism, when it was stamped out in the Middle East, didn't quite disappear. Some Gnostics survived. They made their way through, through the Balkans into northern France, 
and eventually settled down in southern France in the area that's called the Languedoc or Occitania today. Uh, these were a people who called themselves the Tatars, and they were a true Gnostic sect, the Gnostic form of Christianity. Uh, they regarded Christ as a great Gnostic teacher in, in their view. Uh, they created a beautiful society with absolute equality between men and women. Um, a, a society uh, that uh, encouraged universal literacy. They were paper makers and they, they spread universal literacy when the Roman Catholic Church was totally against universal literacy. Um, and uh, really a, a wonderful society ahead of its time in the 11th, 12th centuries uh, AD. But they had one problem. They regarded the Pope as the agent of the devil on earth. And that was a very dangerous thing to do in that period. But as a result, uh, a crusade was declared against the Qatars. It's called the Albi Gentian Crusades, uh, after the town of Albi in the Qatar area. Uh, and this vast army came down from northern France uh, in the beginning of the 1200s, and its project was to completely exterminate the Qatars. And that's what they did. The Qatars fought back. It took about 30 years uh, for the extermination, for the ethnic cleansing, as we would call it today, to be complete. But the Cathars were wiped out. There were massive burnings at the stake. Their books and their documents, again, were all destroyed because constantly we're trying to edit the historical record so that we don't know the truth about ourselves. Uh, and and uh, the, the destruction of the Gnostics all took place, uh, headed by the religion that worships the Demiurge from the Gnostic point of view. Um, and uh, from that point of view, uh, the Demiurge and his archons and their human servants are always trying to steal the light, and are certainly doing so today. And from the Gnostic point of view, if the light is growing amongst us, and I think it is, uh, then we can be quite sure that tremendous archonic forces are at work in our society to suppress it. And if this Gnostic scenario were correct, then how might we expect these forces to manage? I would say that this is one of the ways. <laughs> Through the priests and the rabbis and the rulers of the three main monotheistic faiths. Um, they are jealous intermediaries who impose themselves between us and the divine. So in these faiths, it's not so much now a matter of direct experience of the divine, of revealed knowledge. It's a matter of sitting and listening to a sermon and being told what the priest thinks. The priest is between us and the divine. Um, and, and that is therefore alienating us from our fundamental right of connection with the divine. Um, and uh, actually, all these religions, they talk the talk of peace and love, but the walk they walk is very, very different. It's a walk of cruelty. It's not so long since the Christian church was burning people at the stake. Early, uh, the 17th, 18th century in England, the, 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 the sex abuse scandals in the, in the Catholic Church. And what about this Islam, you know, stoning women to death? I mean, a woman looks at another man or is unfaithful to her husband and she's going to be stoned to death for that and in the name of God. Is that any kind of God that we could really regard as a God? Or is that some kind of demon that requires us to murder one another for, for, for just being human? Obviously, there's something seriously, seriously wrong with the mind control system in all three of the main monotheistic faiths. Uh, the mass murder of the minority Yazidis by the members of the Islamic State. The Yazid religion actually had its roots in ancient Gnosticism. Uh, and here we see Yazidi refugees fleeing genocide at the hands of, I call it Islamic State, uh, an Abrahamic death cult. Uh, and then, of course, another kind of state. Our governments are also archonic in nature. They are also designed to alienate us from ourselves, to take away from us the responsibility over our own lives, to tell us that they know better about what we should do with our lives than we do. That's why I so much hate and detest the war on drugs, because that's where the skull beneath the, the smile is shown in, in our society. They are telling us that we cannot make responsible decisions as adults, that the state must make those decisions for us, and that is alienating us from a fundamental human right and a fundamental human need to make mistakes too. We must have the right to make mistakes and to learn from our mistakes. We must not be protected from our mistakes by the state. How else can we learn and grow and develop in our society?
Now, what do states do except spread fear and hatred and suspicion and press the patriotism button? I am no fan of patriotism. I see no reason why I should be especially loyal to somebody else who was born on the same piece of land that I was, or under the same government system. One of the qualities of that person, absolutely nothing, except an accident of birth. I want to relate to people at the level of ideas. I, I don't care what their ethnic background is, or what religion they were born into, or what governmental system they were born into. It's, it's, we are all brothers and sisters. It's true, it's a cliche, but it's true. We are all one species. We are all brothers and sisters. If we're going to be patriotic at all, let's be patriotic to the whole human race. Mm -hmm. There's these guys, the big corporations, that's the archons at work as well. Yeah, let's recognize them for what they are. Archons, deceiving us, misleading us, alienating us from our power. And the media, with their rolling 24-hour horrible, horrible news, spreading this miasma of horror around the world, deliberately so, so that we're constantly in a state of fear and alarm, and therefore unable to think clearly about what's going on. It's obvious that we live in a highly mind-controlled society. Uh, I think that these archaic forces have actually created a kind of consciousness monopoly. Uh, and by giving a monopoly to a single state of consciousness and enforcing that monopoly with draconian criminal sanctions, I think it's dangerous. I, I think it's possibly even suicidal for the human race, the course that we are on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, okay, the alert problem solving state of consciousness absolutely has its place. It has its place in airline pilots, it has its place in the uh, government, it has its place in commerce, it has its place massively in warfare. Uh, and we've been, you know, we've been told that this alert problem solving state of consciousness, if we just adhere to it, if we say no to drugs and all of that stuff. You know, that we'll have endless prosperity down the road, but we know that that's not true. We know that that's complete bullshit. We know that the model is broken. We know that the banks cannot go on magically printing electronic money forever. Sooner or later, the band-aids are going to fall off, and this system is going to go down. It's going to fall apart. It's a broken, broken model. It's a system that proliferates horrendous pollution around the planet. Why? The pursuit of short-term commercial gains lead to this. No long-term thinking, no love of the planet, no love of fellow humanity. Just short-term profits drive the, the, the incredible scale of, of pollution that is, that is messing up this beautiful, gorgeous planet that the universe has bestowed upon us. And, well, truly, only an insane society, a society that is truly insane, could not only create nuclear weapons, but then proliferate so that they are all over the world, these horrible, horrible engines of destruction. A sane society would never go that way, would never for a single second contemplate the creation of atomic weapons, and if they had been created, would get rid of them as soon as possible. Uh, the alert problem-solving state of consciousness and our great economic power in the technological society still can't solve the problem of hunger around the world. We have millions going to bed starving every night. What do we have to be so proud of uh, with this system of ours? Uh, and the same madness is at work in the Amazon rainforest. Again, the pursuit of short-term commercial gains is leading to the destruction of this sacred realm, this home of biodiversity. Uh, and what a bad deal it is to cut down the old growth rainforest and replace it with soya bean farm so that cattle can be fed and we can all eat hand hamlets. I mean, what, what a really bad deal that is in the long term. And if we were sane, if we were conscious, we would not allow this to take place. Fundamentally, it's an economic problem in the Amazon. And what is all that's needed is to meet the economic needs of the Amazonian people and say to them, look after the Amazon. Don't allow a single further tree to be cut down. We as the international community will support you in that. We will empower you to do that. It wouldn't even cost that much. I did a back of end up calculation back in the 90s. It looked to me like six months' expenditure on the war in Iraq would have solved the problem of the Amazon. 
But we can't do that. We are prepared to spend billions and trillions on weapons of mass destruction, but we don't really focus on solving the, the problem of the rainforest at all. We're just letting this happen because we are unconscious, because we're insane, because we're under the mind control of Benya. So this is what we spend money on again and again and again. Uh, we're not going to move to a new state of consciousness using the old one. It's too late and down with our chronic constraints. We're going to have to throw off those constraints completely. Gnosticism, I don't think it's going to help us. It's been shattered by 2,000 years of systematic persecution. But in some very unexpected places, uh, we can find and learn from a system of direct spiritual knowledge that taps into the same wellsprings and remains very much alive. And the Amazon is one of those places. Shamanism. And when I talk to Amazonian shamans, the shamans about the sickness of the technological societies, they, they say to me, it's really incredibly simple. You guys have severed your connection to spirit. You need to reconnect to spirit, and you need to do so soon. Otherwise, you're going to bring the whole house of cards down upon your heads and upon ours. And that's why a process of reverse missionary activity is now underway. Missionary activity used to be about, you know, the white guys from the north uh, bringing the good news down to the south, which was actually always in many ways bad news and led to the extermination of cultures and, and, and traditional ways. Nowadays, the missionary activity is going the other way. Now it's shamans from the Amazon who are coming north, bringing ayahuasca to us uh, because they believe passionately that we need it. In order to wake up, we need that kick up the ass that ayahuasca gives. So ayahuasca is indeed the remedy that they propose for our sickness. Uh, and it is a portal to enchanted wealth. For those who have not drunk ayahuasca, uh, the works of Pablo Amaringo, a great ayahuasca shaman, can give some sense of the enchanted nature that we enter into under the influence of ayahuasca, where everything is sentient, everything is filled with with wisdom and intent, uh, and, and we find ourselves in a, in a, in a magical realm. And uh, I'm showing here the work of Alex Gray on the left, a good friend of mine, and the, way, the work of the late uh, Robert Venosa from Boulder, Colorado. Both Alex Gray and Robert Venosa were, were, have been highly influenced uh, by ayahuasca in their art. Um, and what their art uh, manifests um, is imagery about the sacred, magical, enchanted nature of all creation and the interdependence of material and spiritual realms. Uh, a life review is very much part of the ayahuasca uh, experience. This is why you often hear people uh, crying in ayahuasca ceremonies, uh, because what happens is that you flashes before your eyes images of your life and images of the impact that you have had on other people. And you suddenly realize that you're not such a nice person as you thought you were. You suddenly realize the hard edge and pain that your words caused to that person five or eight years ago, or that person yesterday. And you experience that pain from that person's point of view. And that is very humble. And that has the effect of, uh, of motivating us to change our behavior. It is very difficult to change a lifetime of bad habits. And ayahuasca is no magic pill. It won't do that change for you. It will just show you what you need to change. And that's when the real work begins. So let nobody say that ayahuasca is an easy route to enlightenment. It is not. It is a route to years and years and years of hard, painstaking work. And only if we do that work can we manifest the lessons in our lives. So the life of you is part of it. And this is why um, I believe that ayahuasca is so effective in getting people off addictions to hard drugs. Um, the Tarapoto, the, the Takibasi Clinic at Tarapoto in Peru, they're bringing heroin and cocaine addicts there uh, for uh, a month. They give them a dozen ayahuasca sessions. More than half of them leave completely free of their addiction. No withdrawal symptoms. They never return their addiction. Because they've had a revelation, they've understood the root cause, the source of their problem. And actually, ayahuasca intervened in my relationship with cannabis for a very long time. Um, I, uh, I was definitely abusing cannabis. I was using it 16 hours a day, seven hours a week. Um, and uh, that was a big part of my life. I organized my whole life around cannabis as an effect for about 24 years. Um, but uh, I also was getting bent out of shape. I was becoming very paranoid, very suspicious, very jealous. 
Um, I'm not saying that the cannabis caused that. I think cannabis is a beautiful thing. I think that the cannabis revealed that in me. It brought it to the, brought it to the fore. And uh, it was causing a lot of pain to my wife, Samantha, particularly the jealousy and suspicion, ludicrous, ridiculous <laughs> behavior on my part. Samantha and I were down in the Amazon having our annual ayahuasca pilgrimage. And in those five sessions, Mother Ayahuasca gave me just a massive kick up the butt. And I was shown my behavior and, and, and its relationship to cannabis. And it was very clear to me that I had to stop smoking, vaporizing cannabis. And I did. I stopped, actually, for three years from uh, October 2011 until the Joe Rogan experience. <laughs> when Joe asked me, am I still off cannabis? And I said, oh yeah, but I, you know, I've had three years completely abstinence, and I'm beginning to think I might dip my toes back in the water. So Joe says, why don't you start now? <laughs> I pulled out a joint and we smoked it on air. Somehow I managed to hold the conversation together. My goodness, when you've had three years off your tolerance, it's totally reset. Really I mean, a few puffs on a joint that would have done nothing to me three years before, I was flying. Uh, I played the video back, and actually I did manage to keep my breath all the way through. So thank you. Thank uh, you. So at the end of the podcast, I'm still totally stoned. I'm in a rental car, but I know I can't drive. Santa's in LA with our daughter-in-law somewhere, and I get I, I call her up and I say, "You've got to come and rescue me." And, and so she comes in another car, and they drive me drive me home. <laughs> After that, I thought, well, then I did a big trip across Washington State, where of course cannabis is available, um, and uh, I have renewed my relationship with cannabis. I'm yes. not using it. I'm not using it obsessively. I very rarely smoke or vaporize it. I, I like cannabis in an oral form, taken as an oil, and um, uh, I don't use it every day. Uh, but it, it, it's playing an important part in my life, and I think it's, I, I regard it as a, as a sacred ally who should be respected. If I see myself slipping back into those old patterns of behavior, I'm going to stop it. But right now, I don't see myself slipping back into the behavior. So the problem was not the cannabis, the problem was my behavior, and it's my responsibility. To deal with my behavior. I've had ayahuasca sessions since then, and she's had nothing to say about it. So, <laughs> I think it's okay. Um, most frequently, we encounter the spirit of ayahuasca as a creative guide, as a healer, or as a moral teacher. Um, actually, this is one of the reasons why my TED talk was banned, because I contemplated the possibility that the entity that we call Mother Ayahuasca, the other entities we encounter in the ayahuasca state, might be real in some sense. And this goes against the hardline materialist ethos of the head. Um, as far as they're concerned, Mother Ayahuasca is just a figment of our brain on drugs. And there's nothing else to her or other entities than that. But I think actually something much, much more is going on. This is the work of Martina Hoffman, lives in Boulder, Colorado, uh, also an ayahuasca artist. And you can see some of the transformations of Mother Ayahuasca as a jaguar, as a, as a serpent here. And the only posture that really makes sense with ayahuasca, which is a posture of complete surrender. You don't want to be fighting that goddess. You want to work with her. Uh, so what are we doing here? What is the journey that we are on? What is consciousness? What happens to me when I die? What is reality? Um, we know the brain is involved in consciousness in some vital way. Uh, it's obvious that it is, but the exact relationship of the brain to consciousness is less clear than some neuroscientists would wish you to uh, believe. The mainstream view, the view of materialist reductionist science, is that the brain, I'm using analogies here, that the brain makes consciousness, rather in the way that a generator makes a crystal. And uh, the neuroscientists will tell you it's obvious that that's the case. Look, if I damage an area of your brain, an area of your consciousness is going to be affected. Um, therefore, it's obvious that the brain makes consciousness. And from the same perspective, it's obvious that there's no life after death. If you believe that consciousness is manufactured by this physical organ called the brain, when that physical organ is dead, your consciousness is over. That's the end of your story. You just meet. But there's another possibility. Let's talk about Albert Hoffman, who was the discoverer of LSD. Um, some people believe that uh, if you take LSD, it will shorten your life. I'm here to tell you that Albert Hoffman, who took LSD regularly for 
70 odd years, uh, lived until the age of 102. He kept all his faculties intact throughout. Uh, he tells us reality is inconceivable without an experiencing subject. It's the product of the exterior world of the sender and the receiver of ego in whose deepest self the emanations of the exterior world registered by the antennae of the sense organs become conscious. Maybe there's more to the exterior world and our senses, even when extended by the finest scientific instruments, maybe there's more to the exterior world than uh, we are normally able to see. Blake had this idea that if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite. For man has closed himself up until he sees all things through narrow chinks in his cabin. And uh, William James, the brother actually of the novelist Henry James, uh, experimented with not the well known hallucinogen, but nitrous oxide um, <laughs> in the 19th century. And it had a dramatic effect upon him. I won't read all of this, but his conclusion no account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. At any rate, they forbid a premature closing of our accounts with. Reality. And I think that's what materialist science has done. It has prematurely closed its account to reality. We have considered issues that might gradually change that view. Uh, Aldous Huxley you know, regarded the brain as a reducing part, but primarily what it's about is keeping most impressions out, because otherwise we would be just overwhelmed by the totality and by the issue. Uh, and he regarded the psychedelics as gratuitous grace which allowed that reducing part to be eased off a little bit, so that more of reality would come in. Um, and and uh, through these permanent or temporary bypasses, there flows something more than, and above all, something different from the carefully selected utilitarian material, which our narrow individual minds regard as a complete, or at least sufficient picture of reality. Back to Hoffman. Um, and uh, he's, again, Talking of the, as I did before, of the brain as a receiver rather than a generator of consciousness. The receiver is then tuned into another wavelength than that corresponding to normal everyday reality. Since the endless variety and diversity of the universe correspond to infinitely many different wavelengths depending on the adjustment of the receiver, many different realities can become conscious. And Rick Strassman, a professor of psych psychology at the University of New Mexico, uh, did the first uh, detailed research in the modern era with uh, human volunteers and dimethyltryptamine. I don't know how he got permission from the DEA to do that, but he did. And uh, he gave DMT by intravenous infusion to a whole bunch of, of uh, volunteers. Um, and at the end of his project, uh, he was really stunned by the way that the, that the similar experiences that the volunteers had, the similar entities that they encountered, uh, and, and uh, the, the, their sense of entering another world or another realm. And he writes, these worlds are usually invisible to us and our instruments and are not accessible using our normal state of consciousness. However, just as likely as the theory that these worlds exist only in our minds is that they are in reality outside us and freestanding. If we simply change our brain's receiving abilities, we can comprehend and interact with them. Nothing in science uh, allows us to reduce hallucinations to the changes in brain activity that they come through. The analogy I usually give is this one, um, a telescope. We want to look at a distant star. We're going to point this telescope in the right direction, and then we're going to focus the telescope. When we do so, physical changes will take place inside the barrel of the telescope in the relationship between the lenses. Eventually, the star will come into view We'd be completely wrong to say that the star is the physical changes inside the barrel of the telescope. We can't reduce the star to that. The star is real, and the physical changes inside the barrel of the telescope simply allow us to see that star. And that's the suggestion with the hallucinogens and consciousness, that it is in, in, they are making physical changes, chemical changes in the brain, but we cannot reduce the experience to those. Those changes are simply allowing us to see more of reality than normally we do. Um, 20th century society, we, we're really midgets in this area. We, 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 we're infants. We have to sit at the feet of shamans. 
from the hunter-gatherer societies to really work with these states of consciousness because they've been doing it for thousands of years. And altered states of consciousness are the universal feature common to all shamanism. Now, here's a, a, a fact. In, in these altered states, shamans frequently report encounters with intelligent supernatural entities. And these entities are usually construed as spirits. And sometimes they take very anthropic form, sometimes they take animal form, sometimes they take human form. And shamans in all cultures also report that they themselves transform into these forms when they journey in the quote-unquote spirit world. <coughs> Now, many of the experiences that shamans report with uh, spirits are very similar at the level of phenomenology from encounters with aliens reported by tens of thousands of people in the West who believe they've been abducted by UFOs. Uh, and the shamans themselves frequently predict UFOs and aliens in their paintings. Pablo Amarigo's. Uh, here, for example, a classic therianthropic serpent and a flying saucer right beside it. Um, I, uh, when I got Pablo Amarigo's permission years ago to use his images in my book, I, I got into several conversations with him. And I said, Pablo, why do you paint flying saucers in your ayahuasca visions? Are you, are you saying that beings are coming here from other planets? And, and he said, no, no. Flying saucers are vehicles for entering and leaving the spirit world. And that rang a bell with me, because when a shaman talks about the spirit world, he's not very far away from a quantum physicist talking about a parallel universe. And I began to wonder, maybe that's why the UFO experience is so lucid. Maybe it's some kind of interdimensional contact that's going here. And if that's the case, no wonder that we're getting access to it through shifts in consciousness. Uh, the UFO lobby generally is against psychedelics and is uh, even more materialistic than the most materialistic scientists who want everything to be about matter and tech and machines and, and so on and so forth. And they hate the idea that consciousness might be a route to explore these mysterious experiences. I think it's actually a very fruitful route. Um, Mercia Eliad, his grand book, Shamanism, will tell you just reams of pages about the experiences, the phenomenology of shamanism. And if you want to know about the phenomenology of UFO abductions, look at the work of the late uh, Dr. John Mack, or Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard University, by Hopkins, David Jacobs, and others. I mean, we have a massive dossier of the experiences of UFO abductees and of the experiences of shamans. And uh, when you compare them, we find they're astonishingly similar. Uh, so the spirits shamans encounter most frequently first appear in the form of animals, birds, or fish, or as therian And here we have um, Virginia Horton, minutes before she's abducted, uh, she finds herself talking with an intelligent gray deer and feels there's a person inside the deer. Another sees a deer, another sees a wolf standing on her bed. John Mack summarizes, the aliens appear to be consummate shapeshifters, often appearing initially to the abductees as animals, Owls, eagles, raccoons, and deer are among the creatures the abductees have seen initially. Um, shamanistic experiences of being floated up into the sky to metal objects in the sky or climbing threads of light to those metal objects in the sky, that is also repeated by UFO abductees. They are floated up to the UFO or they climb threads of light uh, to the UFO. Uh, shamans, as well as being taken up to flying objects, are often abducted underwater or into caves, turns out the same experience is repeated by UFO abductees. Betty Aho, uh, the UFO plunged into the sea and came out again and entered huge crystalline caverns. Gilberto Caribenas goes into a tunnel beneath the sea. Carlos Diaz uh, sees the craft standing inside a cave that was lined with stalactites and stalagmites. The characteristic the experience of shamanism is the shamanic ordeal, where the shaman experiences himself or herself undergoing a bizarre form of surgery at the hands of the spirits, uh, having objects inserted under their skin or into their brains, um, being poked and, and pierced. Um, and uh, these bizarre surgical experiences are also a very common feature of UFO abduction. Many UFO abductees have experienced surgery 
at the hands of the uh, aliens. And the comparisons are between these two supposedly very different domains are, are really quite close, like Sandra Larson is abducted by a UFO, beings removed her brain and set it down beside her. And then there's a Yakut shaman cited by Eliad, the spirits cut off his head, which they set aside. UFO abductees have their bones counted, shamans have their bones counted by spirits. So, you know, rising similarities. Shamans are always having sex with spirits. They've always got babies in the spirit world. Uh, hybrid, part spirit, part human babies. Uh, and again, UFO abductees are always having sex with aliens. Um, to, um, to, uh, have part alien, part human babies, which they're often re-abducted to nature. What really is the difference between these two domains? Um, this is the Rupertsberg Codex. Eyes are a very common aspect of the DMT experience. Uh, DMT is closely related to psilocybin. Um, here in this 12th century codex, we see those eyes. We see a connection to the womb of a woman down below. And up here in the basket, what do we see with a mushroom? With a little gnome sitting over the top of it. Uh, and I can't tell you what this is all about. Arthur Gelder, 1710. Baptism of Christ or Shamanic Initiation. What's going on there? Um, Maria Sabina was given a book by a spirit. She learned how to do her work better, the secrets of the world where everything is known, but the spirit would not allow Maria to keep the book. Betty Hill had the same experience. The leader of the aliens gave her a book but took it back from her before she left the ship. Another was given a small blue book with 40 luminous pages, but soon afterwards it disappeared. Uh, and like shamans after their encounters with spirits, many people have been return with a sense of mission, a feeling that they have the responsibility for deep knowledge and, and healing power that they've received. So, what are fairies and elves? What is, what is all that about? And why do they have so much in common with aliens and spirits? The go-to book here is Jack Vallée's Passport to Magonia which was published in 1969. Uh, in my own book, Supernatural, I simply took forward when I entered into this area of the discussion, the dossier that, that Jacques Vallée had prepared up for 69, and I brought it forward into the 21st century. Uh, the, the, the connections between fairy realms and uh, alien realms are very close. Uh, for example, fairies, just like spirits, just like aliens, were in the business of abducting people. They did it all the time. Um, and they could be cruel, they tortured and hurt human beings, just like aliens and spirits do, but they also gave gifts of healing power. Uh, like aliens and spirits, fairies have the power of flight, they make use of aerial vehicles, flying boats, flying castles, flying carriages, etc. Uh, fairy abductions uh, frequently take place underground, into the hollow hills. Interestingly, in both these woodcuts, we see a mushroom underneath Muscaria here, and probably Silas Knight down there. Um, and like aliens and spirits, fairies and elves often appear in the form of animals or asterianthropes. Um, here, Pelusi, a feared medieval fairy who abducted human babies. She's part serpent, part human in form. And here, a group of fairies dancing in the ring. This is a 15th century woodcut from Holland. Of course, they're classic creatures of vision. They have their fairy crops, the heads of human beings and the bodies of animals. Uh, it's obvious to me at any rate that fairy imagery and cave art must have been inspired by similar experiences. And again, there are compelling crossovers with the reported experiences of modern UFO contact groups. So, this is an image from Angoulême in France, about uh, 27,000 years old. This is Pech Merle, this curious figure, something in the sky above it. But look at that face, that high domed forehead, the narrow pointed chin. We redraw it here. I would say it looks like a lot like the entities that we call alien gray today. Um, these objects on cave walls have never been identified by archaeologists, but they look a lot to me like Pablo Amarillo's vehicles for entering and leaving the spirit world. Um, two of the three images here are finger tracings done on clay more than 15,000 years ago. Uh, and, and another one was drawn by an American youth lab that he, who told researcher John Mack that it was projected into her visual field after each abduction experience. <laughs> That's the modern one. Those are the stone what I would say they're inspired by the same source. So quickly through uh, Rick Strassman's work, 
um, with human volunteers at the University of New Mexico. I do urge you very much to read DMT, the Spirit Molecule, if you haven't. It's a most extraordinary and extremely important book. Um, and uh, I'm going to have to cut a long story short, but the crossovers are then again there. Jim, DMT volunteer. There were clinical researchers probing into my mind. There were sort of long fiber optic things that they were putting into my pupils. Carl sees a lot of elves. Lucas sees a space station below him and to his right with entities inside the space station. Ben has something inserted into his left forearm. Um, <laughs> this is this proof that I can't draw. <laughs> this was an ayahuasca experience I had when I'm sitting in the jungle on a bench and suddenly I know I'm going to be infected. And there's flying saucers up there and there's this alien gray face looking down at me. And I say, I open my eyes and I say, no! <laughs> of course, I should have kept my eyes shut and said, yes! <laughs> Take me! But fear got in the way. These guys have never come back oh. since then. Yeah. I'm just making the point that uh, uh, these, these encounters with sort of insect-like creatures, again, very common in Chinese society. Um, and very interestingly, a number of the volunteers came back having met entities who said to them, basically, we are so glad you've discovered this technology. Now we can communicate with you much more easily. Thought-provoking, as you said. Um, so DMT is an entirely natural product of the human body. It's quite unique. It's an endogenous human psychedelic. And it's found in blood, in plasma, in urine, in cerebrospinal fluid, usually in some psychedelic quantities. Its function is unknown because there just hasn't been enough research. Um, the pineal gland is strongly associated with the DMT, and recent research is bearing this out. Uh, and it's interesting that in evolutionary older animals, the pineal gland actually has a lens, a cornea, and a retina. Uh, in humans, it's sunk deeper into the brain, it's no longer light sensitive, but maybe DMT is its lens, uh, allowing us access to the beyond, the kind of sixth sense. Um, Strassman recognized the remarkable similarity between new blood that these reports and the reports of his own volunteers. And we know those volunteers weren't physically at that. They were lying on a hospital bed in the University of New Mexico. It was their consciousness that was being conducted. And what Strassman proposed was that UFO abductees might be spontaneous overproducers of endogenous DMT. It's very important to be clear, Strassman was at pains to emphasize this did not imply that such experiences mediated by DMT were in any way unreal. Mm -hmm. He's very open to the possibility that they're entirely real. By conceiving of the brain as a receiver of information, when can accommodate the biological model of changing brain function with a chemical. At the same time, it allows for the possibility that what is being received, while not usually perceptible, is consistently and verifiably existent for a large number of individuals. It may indeed reflect stable, freestanding, and parallel planes of reality. Look, uh, we human beings cannot see something without interpreting. Interpretation is built into perception from the get-go. <laughs> I would say that in these three supposedly different domains, spirits, fairies, aliens, we are actually looking at the same phenomenon through different cultural spectrums. That explains the subtle differences and the commonality, different periods of history. And from time to time, down the millennia, these perceptions have brought us the forbidden fruit of gnosis and reawakened us to the true nature of things. Now, I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. I've got about 10 minutes to run, and then I will take questions. Um, are all different techniques and substances for altering consciousness really portals to other worlds and dimensions, as shamans and increasingly some scientists believe? Or could there be some other explanation? Personally, I'll tell you now, I favor the doorway to other dimensions. But I want to offer an alternative, um, just as good as before. Um, it's understood that we have built-in brain modules. And actually, scientists who look at this say we must have a brain module for this stuff. Um, we all have intuitive knowledge of physics. You may have thought that through, but we all have intuitive knowledge of physics. So if I were to pick up a rock and uh, throw it at, uh, at you, you would be able to deflect it, probably. But consider what goes on in that deflection. 
you're doing at light speed a um, complex mathematical calculation that involves the trajectory, the power of the throw, the object, everything, and bang, you've got it out of the way. And we can understand why evolution would invest in a brain module like that. Because, you know, if you don't have rock dodging genes, you're less likely to pass on your genes to the next generation. Except, why would we have a brain module for very groups and abductions by spirits and fairies and aliens? And why could these spirit modules only be activated in altered states of consciousness? What, what use could they be? Francis Crick was won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the double helix of the DNA. Francis Crick wrote an extraordinary book in 1981, called Life Itself. This is the world expert on DNA. But Francis Crick's view was that DNA, the DNA RNA system, could not have evolved on this planet in the time that was available for it to do so. Uh, the earlier is too hot for life. Uh, by about 3.9 billion years ago, it's cooled enough for life. By 3.8 billion years ago, just 100 million years later, Bacterial life is all, and certain aspects of that code code for the construction of proteins and the making of bodies. But there's an awful lot of DNA that doesn't do that, and that's referred to as junk DNA. 97% of DNA is, is junk DNA. Scientists are beginning to realize it isn't junk at all. It plays a very, very important role. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Uh, there is a characteristic of all human language which is designated Zipf's law after the linguist who identified this. There's a mathematical relationship of frequency against rank. For example, in round numbers, if word rank 1 appears 10,000 times, the word rank 10 will appear 1,000 times, the word rank 100 will appear 100 times. This is true of all human languages, whether it's Hosa, Japanese, Mandarin, English, German, whatever. They all have this mathematical relationship. It turns out, that that mathematical relationship is found in the code of junk DNA. Uh, that it, the non-coding regions produce that same frequency rank chart that we get in all human languages. I called up Eugene Stanley, who published this article in Science in uh, 1994, and I said to him, come on, tell me what you really think. And he said, I think there's a message written in our DNA. This is the area where I am willing to contemplate alien involvement. Not recently, not in the historical science, but right back at the origins of life. And Francis Crick um, adamantly contemplated that as well. DNA data storage break record. We now know that we can just store vast amounts of information on DNA. And Crick's idea was this, that, uh, that there had been an advanced civilization on the other side of the galaxy, far, far away. And... Uh, this advanced civilization, he pointed out there's time for life to evolve twice since the Big Bang, 13 and a half, 14 billion years. But this advanced civilization discovered that it was going to be wiped out. A uh, supernova was going to go off in the vicinity, perhaps, and sterilize the planet. So their first thought would have been to get life off the planet, get themselves off the planet. But they would have, and go to another one, but they would have discovered that the distances in interstellar space are too great, the possibility of preserving these bodies wouldn't work. So they went for the next best thing. They sent the code of life out into the universe. They genetically engineered bacteria, made them very hardy, packed them into cryogenic chambers, stuck them into spaceships, and fired them off in all directions into the universe. And 3.9 billion years ago, one of those rockets hit the early Earth, and here we are, the descendants of that directive and sperm. Crick did not say the next thing, but taking his argument, if they were going to do that, and since we now know that DNA can record vast amounts of knowledge, and since there are highly conserved segments of DNA that never change for billions and billions of years, maybe they recorded all the knowledge of their civilization and inserted it into us. Maybe there's a hidden archive within our DNA, and maybe that's what we access in deeply altered states of consciousness. Well, as I say, uh, that is not my view. I do think that they are in portals to other realms and dimensions, but I can't prove that. I've put the other idea there for, for thought. Uh, whatever they are, these substances are not brain candy. These substances used rightly with respect, with reverence, with the correct intent, can be utterly transformatory. Utterly transformatory. Uh, science is beginning 
to patch up with this, it's beginning to realize that these demonized substances have a huge therapeutic role uh, as well. And uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were quite frank. Uh, if they hadn't used LSD, they'd never have invented the Apple computer. Uh, Steve Jobs, as a matter of fact, the first question he would ask a programmer seeking a job was, have you taken LSD? If the answer was no, that programmer was out of there. Um, so, a huge technological breakthrough in our society owes its origins to the demonized substance called LSD. And it turns out Francis Crick was a big user of LSD. Um, and as a matter of fact, this is of course disputed these days, but Francis Crick uh, told uh, his friend that he had first really got it about the double helix. Of course, a lot of work was done, but the moment when he got it, he was under the influence of LSD. Great breakthrough, uh, again, attributed not to the alert problem solving state of consciousness, but to the vision of state. The Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden, good and evil, essential for the progress of the soul. We remind ourselves of the therianthropic nature of the serpent. And we come to this moment in Genesis when the demiurge, or God, if we want to call him that, drives Adam and Eve out of the garden for eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he explains why he's driving them out and why he's never going to allow them back in. Lest they eat of the tree of life and become gods like us. It gives me chills when I who are these gods? Who is this us that's being referred to in Genesis? Somewhere in all of this the mystery of the knowledge of good and evil and the mystery of the mortal life, I would suggest, I can see it. And what's at stake is not small. There's a struggle underway for the future direction of human consciousness. And uh, as we know, we live in a society that will send us to prison, that will ruin our names and our reputations uh, for exploring our own consciousness with the time on a sacred part. So what more than the exploration and expansion of consciousness? What will, and surely this is the essence of being human. And by demonizing and persecuting all the states of consciousness today, I suspect we're denying ourselves the next vital step in our own evolution. If we're going to heal the planet, then first and foremost, we're going to have to reconnect with spirits, and we're going to have to re-establish sovereignty over our own consciousness and resist all of those archonic forces that seek to tell us that our consciousness is not our business, it's their business. Those are the archons of work. Those are the agents of mind control. It's essential for the progress of the human race that we exist in, and I end on the same note as I ended the last four. Otherwise, who knows? We may become the next lost civilization. Mm -hmm.
where these subjects were not surrounded by the level of demonization that they're surrounded by in our society, where parents could give good advice to their uh, youngsters. Um, I, I think that parents could be involved in making that decision. As a matter of fact, actually wrote a wonderful book called Island, where the, the sacrament was a psychedelic mushroom. And, and uh, you know, it was essential, central to the culture of that society. We haven't learned the way to, you know, to do that. We need to, we need to find a way to do it. But um, um, I think that a, a certain level of maturity is useful and helpful when it comes to, say, baby psychedelics. And I certainly would not wish to share psychedelics with uh, teenagers, as a matter of fact. I would say, wait, be patient, get into your 20s, get yourself a bit settled, and then have this experience. I have, I have some that I have six children in between us. They're all adults now. We drunk ayahuasca with four of us. But we did wait until they were in their own uh, before we invite like, uh, the joint ceremony. And I, I think that's the right thing to do. I think, this, I think it's right and proper that certain experiences should be reserved for, for adults. Childhood is a process where we're very malleable, we're learning, we're vulnerable. And I think at that time, uh, psychedelics would probably not be helpful. Um, certainly in our culture. I have to say, in the Amazon, there are some Amazonian cultures that give a teaspoon of ayahuasca to you or me. Um, and, and it's considered you know, very, very important. But we have to remember that we live in this fractured, disjointed society, and if we're going to work with these harmful substances, we need to we need to have certain guidelines. And I think keeping them out of the hands of children is one of those is one of those guidelines. But I'm okay. um, Do you think there's also a physical aspect? Like I've heard that it's possible that they might damage your developing mind or brain rather. Well, I, I mean, bear, bear in mind that we're surrounded by the miasma of propaganda of the war on drugs, but yes, there are some indications that that might be the case. That's true, that's true for example, with, uh, with, with marijuana. I think that I think the cannabis isn't, isn't that helpful for teenagers. Um, it often puts teenagers into a kind of dysfunctional dream state for years, uh, and, and it can affect the, the development of the, of the brain. So, all, all of these things, you know, we're all going to be adults sooner or later. Just be patient. The time, the, time, the time will come. If we weren't surrounded by the horrible atmosphere of the war on drugs, I think people would be much more willing to wait a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, I have a question. Uh, so um, first of all, as a recent graduate here in the field of archaeology, it's a great honor to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm a master's student studying Quebec and Tepe, uh -huh. uh, and I'm working uh, with my professor at the Public Service soon, and intend to do it uh, field work at the site for coming years. Um, uh, my question is, how can someone like me get involved in field work and study at the site, and uh, what are the implications? Well, in the case of in the case of Gobek and Tepe, the site is under the German Archaeological Institute, um, and they are the official excavators of the site. And we need to take contact with them. Uh, Gobek and Tepe at the moment is a difficult place to work. It's 30 miles from the Syrian border. Uh, really, there have been terribly disturbing incidents in the Gobek and Tepe area, particularly in the city of Shandi Orfa, which is where you stay when you go to Gobek and Tepe. Um, there have been suicide bombings, and the whole, the whole situation is in turmoil in that area because of what's happening along the border. And uh, it's not clear to me that any archaeology is going to be right now. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. What they've done is they've constructed this hideous roof that they've put over the top of the back of the a very heavy wooden structure, which almost entirely cuts out the light and has to protect it, but it also shuts it down from, from view and from experience in a very sad way. Uh, I think. And uh, uh, William Hardine's work has been stopped since uh, 2014. Um, but you already, we were already in contact by email, I believe. Yeah. And uh, I can connect you with Danny Hillman, who is the, uh, the, the geologist who's led the exploration of the Vector Tech. We're very happy to connect you with him. And we're hoping to get that work restarted. It was objections from archaeologists that stopped us. So I appreciate that. Um, and you know, I've heard the class said that if anyone. Up Not really. There is, there is somebody else running the site at the moment. I haven't been in touch with that person. I've not heard anything about it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Cheers. Hello, Graham. Thank Hi. you for your talk. Uh, I have a question with regards to uh, Francis Crick and directed uh, Hansburg. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you viewed it uh, as not entirely the way uh, of, uh, you'll forgive me, uh, when you spoke with regards to uh, ayahuasca being uh, a portal, or, yeah. and that as opposed to uh, Francis Crick. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, that could be both. Yeah, it could be both. Uh, it, it, could, it could be both. Um, this is again a, a, an area where we're groping in the dark, the lack of research. Not enough, there's not, not enough research has been done. Uh, and it needs, it needs to be done. The mystery of consciousness is the greatest mystery of consciousness. What this thing called consciousness actually is, yeah. that's where we should be devoting the great deal of attention. I'm open to the it's both of us. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, okay. I, I listen to uh, some of the hours a day of uh, you, Chance, and Jim, and Jim. So, uh, you, Stephane! I recently consumed a rather heroic dose of psilocybin, about 7.5 grams. Okay. Uh, I spent about 10 hours in, in pure meditative state. Right. Uh, I noticed uh, the next day after a series of incidents happened to me that night. Where I, I could all of a sudden essentially, uh, almost autonomously reverse engineer all, all religious scripture, all alchemic scripture in a way I don't think many people have been able to consider. And uh, I believe there's a direct synonymous connection with, uh, with enlightenment, the halo, uh, illumination, and uh, probably head exploding syndrome. And I'm wondering, heard of that one. Right, okay, well, I'm wondering, uh, ever since this has happened to me, by the way, uh, well, not only have a lot of synchronistic events occurred, but also uh, it seems to me like I can't stop by writing sometimes 5,000 words a day. Right? That's so, a pretty good output. Now, this never happened before this, by the way. Mm -hmm. This just happened a couple of months ago. Yeah. Uh, how, do I, how, do I, how do I traject uh, this writing uh, you know, on a paper? How do I get it out here? What do you give any advice for people who might have... I, I feel like I might have figured something out. And I think, I, you know, maybe we can get into course. But if you're interested in this, uh, I feel like, you know, Terrence McKenna said, we must find the others. But yeah. I think it's time I found uh, the others, because yeah. I had something to tell them. I don't know if we'll ever figure it out. Uh, how? <laughs> well, I'm not the founder of all knowledge. Uh, as, a, as a writer, I can tell you that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, writing is, as somebody once said, genius 99%. 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. Uh, no point in being a gifted writer if you're not prepared to do the hard work. You've got to do it, and you've got to great that you can produce a 5,000 words a day. Uh, and sometimes I can run 3,000 words a day. Yes, that's wild. I never even really considered this. But sometimes, sometimes less. Um, so the question is, what's the quality of those words? Are they, are they good words? Is it, is it strong material that's coming out? Or, or is it, oh, I can't know that without, without reading? Hey, come see me outside. The that's what I was hoping to actually, this was actually the whole reason that I have done this. Okay, come and see me. Thanks, brother. Have a good, uh, good day. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.
Are you going to put it online anywhere? Uh, they've been putting up on support local scene. Are you going to YouTube and support local scene? And the, the, the old ones are up there. Yeah, I'll, I can probably search for it. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Oh, good. Mm -hmm. That he can kind of stay on point. It's here, but I can't. Okay, get it. Your <laughs> you know? oh, there's a top and a side. Oh, right. It's right. It's right. Okay. It is for sure. I'm going to give you a book right now. Oh, okay. okay. The problem is, everyone's going to talk to me. Two minutes. Alternate universe. All right. Oh, yeah. So, which book?